This is a film about revolutionary Ireland. The years 1912 to 1923 are some of the most eventful in Irish history. This period is being remembered around Ireland as the decade of centenaries. Between 2012 to 2023, we are marking the 100 year anniversaries of these events in Ireland. First, we're going to take a quick look back in time to the background of this period. The world looked very different than it does today. Europe was dominated by powerful empires, and these empires had colonies that stretched across the world. At its height, the British Empire covered a quarter of the land area of the world. Much of Europe was ruled by kings, queens and emperors, who inherited their power. However, things were beginning to change with the spread of new ideas such as nationalism and democracy. These ideas led to the French and American revolutions, which would influence revolutionaries here in Ireland. Ireland had a long and complicated history with England. The country had been under some form of control from Britain for centuries. There were many unsuccessful rebellions against British rule in the 1700s. Not everyone was treated equally under British rule. The penal laws discriminated against Catholics and Presbyterians in Ireland. Daniel O'Connell was an important figure in Irish history who worked to bring about Catholic emancipation in Ireland. Land ownership also caused unrest. The majority of the land was owned by a small number of mostly Protestant landlords. This led to the land war in the late 1800s. In 1801, the Act of Union was passed and Ireland became part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. Ireland would now be ruled directly from London. Elected Irish MPs would have to sit in the Westminster Parliament. In the 1840s, the potato blight arrived in Ireland and ruined the potato crop. Much of the population depended on the potato crop for survival. When the crop failed, it brought famine. Many who could not afford to pay their rent were evicted, and thousands of people ended up in the workhouses. One million died of starvation and disease. Another one million emigrated, often travelling in poor conditions in ships known as coffin ships. The population roughly halved as a result of the famine, and has still not recovered. Many in Ireland were unhappy with the reaction of the British government to the famine. This increased anti-British feeling in Ireland. In the 1800s, there were two new political forces in Ireland, nationalism and unionism. Nationalism was a powerful force in many parts of Europe in the 1800s. The idea behind nationalism was that groups of people who were united by things in common like language, ethnicity, culture, geography or religion, should be able to form their own nation and rule themselves. Irish nationalists were against the union with Britain. Most nationalists were Catholic, but a number of leading nationalists were Protestant. Nationalists did not all want the same thing. Some nationalists wanted a small amount of independence from Britain, while others wanted complete separation and an Irish Republic. Some nationalists wanted to use peaceful means, while others believed that the use of force was the only way to bring about change. Isaac Butt was a Protestant barrister from Stranorla in County Donegal. As a young man, he was a Unionist, but his ideas changed after he witnessed the tragedy of the Great Famine. He felt that the government in London was too far away to rule Ireland properly. He founded the Home Rule Party, also called the Irish Parliamentary Party, the Home Rule Party wanted an Irish Parliament in Dublin that would rule over local Irish affairs. Home Rule aimed for moderate independence for Ireland, which would still remain part of the United Kingdom. Earl Stuart Parnell was a Protestant landowner who became the leader of the Home Rule Party after Isaac Butt died. He was also a leading figure in the Land League and was involved in organising a campaign against the landlords called the Land War. Under his leadership, Home Rule became very popular in most of the country, except in Ulster, where more of the population were Unionists. Parnell was involved in a scandal, the party split, and support for Home Rule died away for years. John Redmond became the leader of the Home Rule Party. The third Home Rule Bill was passed in the House of Commons and was supposed to become law by 1914. However, World War I began, and Home Rule was postponed until the war ended.
Sinn Féin was another nationalist political party that was set up by a journalist called Arthur Griffith. Sinn Féin aimed for slightly more change than the Home Rule Party. Griffith wanted Ireland to be completely free of the Westminster government. He wanted Irish MPs to ignore Westminster and form their own parliament in Dublin. Ireland would still be part of the British Empire with the King as head of state. At first, Sinn Féin wasn't very popular and most nationalists voted for the Home Rule Party. The IRB, or the Irish Republican Brotherhood, were a secret society. They wanted to cut all links with Britain and set up an Irish Republic. They were willing to use force and they wanted a rebellion against Britain. The IRB secretly infiltrated, or tried to take over, lots of other nationalist organisations. Cultural nationalism was the idea of using old Gaelic culture to create a strong Irish identity. Nationalists thought that if Ireland had a unique culture that was different from Britain's, then other countries might support Irish independence. The GAA was set up to develop and protect Irish sports. Members were banned from British games, like cricket and rugby. By the early 1900s, the GAA was already very successful. The Gaelic League was set up to protect Irish language and culture. The League wanted to encourage people to speak and learn the Irish language. It also promoted traditional Irish dances. Another movement was the Literary Revival. There was more interest in Irish writing. Many of the leading writers were Southern Protestants. Irish language newspapers were set up and the Abbey Theatre was founded so that people could see Irish plays performed by Irish writers. These movements made more Irish people feel that Ireland should have some kind of independence from Britain. Many people who would later be nationalist leaders were first involved in the Gaelic Revival. Unionists wanted Ireland to remain in the Union with Britain. They believed that the Union was good for Ireland. Who were the Unionists? Most Unionists lived in Ulster, where they came from all social classes. There were a small number of Unionists in the South, but most of these were very wealthy and influential. Many Unionists were the descendants of British people who had settled in Ireland during the plantations. They felt British as well as Irish. Most Irish Protestants were Unionists. They felt comfortable remaining in the UK, which was a Protestant state. Ireland was mostly Catholic, and many Protestants worried that they would be discriminated against if Ireland was independent. Unionists believed that they would be better off economically by remaining in the Union, which gave trade access to Britain and the Empire. Wealthy landowners and business owners and workers in industrialised Belfast all worried they could be worse off in an independent Ireland. In the 1880s, the Unionist Party was formed. It aimed to prevent Home Rule and keep Ireland in the United Kingdom. The Unionist Party got a lot of support from the Orange Order, which was a Protestant-only organisation that was very strong in Ulster. Edward Carson and James Craig led the Unionist Party. Carson was a Dublin-born lawyer. He used rallies and speeches to unite Irish Unionists and get the support of British politicians. Craig was a wealthy Belfast industrialist. He organised Unionist resistance to Home Rule. In 1912, it looked like Home Rule might come to Ireland. This led to greater opposition from Unionists, who took part in mass demonstrations against Home Rule. The largest event was Ulster Day in September 1912. 470,000 men signed the Ulster Solemn League and Covenant, promising that they would fight against Home Rule. 250,000 women signed the Ulster Declaration. It is sometimes said that some Unionists felt so strongly that they signed the Declaration in their own blood. Unionist resistance focused on Ulster, where there was the largest population of Unionists in the country. The Ulster Volunteer Force was set up in 1913. The UVF was basically a private Unionist army that would fight against Home Rule. In reaction to the UVF, 
the Nationalists set up the Irish Volunteers. This was a private army run by Nationalists that would fight for Home Rule. At the same time, a Nationalist women's group called Common Naman was set up. At first, both the UVF and the Irish Volunteers were poorly armed, but the two groups took part in gun running from Germany. The UVF smuggled weapons into Larne, and the Irish Volunteers smuggled weapons into Hoth. There were now two private armies in Ireland, and the country looked like it could be on the edge of civil war. The start of World War I was a bigger crisis, and it paused the situation in Ireland. The First World War was the first conflict that was fought on a global scale. The war began in August 1914. At first, people thought that the war would be over quickly. In Ireland in 1914, both nationalist and unionists supported the war. Both groups also hoped that fighting on the side of the British would help them get what they wanted from Britain after the war. In Ireland, Carson called on the Ulster Volunteer Force to join the British Army and fight in World War I. Redmond also called on the Irish Volunteers to fight for Britain. This caused a split in the Irish Volunteers. Most followed Redmond and joined the British Army. They became known as the National Volunteers. A minority kept the name the Irish Volunteers and they stayed in Ireland to plan a rebellion. This group believed that the war was an opportunity for Ireland. The First World War involved new weapons such as poison gas, bombing raids, tanks, submarines and military aircraft and a new type of warfare called trench warfare. Massive numbers of soldiers were involved in the war and around 10 million died. The British government considered introducing conscription in Ireland in 1918. Conscription meant that all men of fighting age would have to serve in the British Army. The war had become very unpopular and the conscription crisis increased anti-British feeling and made the nationalists stronger. By the end of the war, around 30,000 Irish men had died in World War I. The national volunteers who stayed in Ireland were the more extreme members of the volunteers and included IRB men who had secretly joined the organisation. They planned an All-Ireland Rising on Easter Sunday, 1916. Much of their plans for the Rising went wrong. A range of nationalist groups were involved. These groups did not all agree or share information with each other. The leader of the volunteers had tried to cancel the Rising. A ship carrying smuggled arms was almost captured by British forces and sunk. In the confusion, the Rising only took place in Dublin. There were less rebels than expected, they had a shortage of weapons, and they failed to capture some important buildings. Many nationalist groups were involved, including the IRB, the Irish Volunteers, the Irish Citizens Army and Common Naman. Around 2,000 rebels occupied the GPO and other important Dublin buildings. They proclaimed the Irish Republic and raised the Irish tricolour flag for the first time. British reinforcements arrived in Dublin and shelled the city. In the fighting, many civilians were killed. The rebels surrendered after six days. At first, public opinion was against the Rising. Large areas of Dublin were destroyed and civilians had been killed and wounded. Outside of Dublin, many Irish people were not sure what had happened. The country was buzzing with rumours. In the confusion, the Easter Rising was wrongly called the Sinn Féin Rising. The British government reacted harshly to the Rising. There were mass arrests across Ireland. 3,500 people were arrested, many of them knew nothing about the Rising. Prisoners were tried in secret military trials, and 88 were sentenced to death. 16 of the leaders were executed. The arrests and executions led to growing public support for the Rising. Many of the prisoners were sent to prison camps in Britain. In these camps, prisoners trained and organised for a future rebellion. The camps became known as the Universities of Republicanism. Some of the people involved in the Rising would later become very important. Eamon de Valera was the only leader of the Easter Rising who wasn't executed. He was sentenced to death 
but escaped because he was an American citizen. Michael Collins fought in the Rising. He was arrested and sent to a prison camp in Wales, where he became an important rebel leader. Countess Markovich was from a landlord family in Sligo. She had helped set up Nafina and was also involved in the Irish Citizens Army. During the Rising, she was the second in command in Stephen's Green. She was sentenced to death, but she escaped execution because she was a woman. After World War I ended, the British government called a general election for December 1918. People had thought that Sinn Féin was responsible for the Easter Rising. After the Rising, Sinn Féin became very popular. The party now wanted complete separation from Britain. De Valera took over as president of Sinn Féin and became president of the Irish Volunteers. In the election, Sinn Féin did very well and they won the majority of the votes in the south of Ireland. Ulster was more divided, with nationalists winning in some areas and unionists in others. Sinn Féin refused to take their seats in the Westminster Parliament. The TDs met in Dublin on the 21st of January 1919. They set up their own parliament, the first Dáil Éireann, and declared Irish independence. In 1918, the British government had arrested many leading nationalists. When the Dáil first met, many of the TDs were still in jail. This was the last general election that took place on an all-Ireland basis. It was also the first general election where women could vote. Countess Markovich was elected, and she would have been the first woman elected to the Westminster Parliament. The new Dáil government planned to ignore Westminster and rule Ireland themselves. Eamon de Valera was elected as president. He was sent to the USA to get money and support from Irish Americans. The same day as the first Dáil met, Irish volunteers ambushed RIC policemen in Solo Head Beg. They stole their weapons and explosives and two RIC men were killed in the ambush. The Dáil had not ordered the attack, but this event was the start of the War of Independence. The Royal Irish Constabulary, or RIC, were the police force in Ireland. They were an armed police force and had both Catholic and Protestant members. The Irish volunteers targeted them because they were symbols of British rule in Ireland and a source of weapons for the volunteers. During the War of Independence, the Irish volunteers became the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, the army of the future Irish state. Britain banned the Dáil in 1919 and members of the Dáil had to go on the run. The Dáil set about taking over the country by using non-violent resistance to British forces. The Dáil raised money for the government, its civil servants and its army, set up its own courts and tried to get other countries to recognise Irish independence. The War of Independence lasted from 1919 to 1921. The IRA began a campaign of guerrilla warfare against British forces. Guerrilla warfare meant surprise attacks and ambushes, raids and hit and run tactics. Michael Collins was responsible for these tactics. While de Valera was away in America, Collins became a very important figure in Ireland, both in the Dáil and in the IRA. The level of IRA activity varied from place to place because each local commander controlled their own area. The Dáil did not have much control over the IRA. At first, IRA attacks focused on the RIC, and RIC barracks were raided for their guns and their ammunition. The Dáil called for a boycott of the RIC in 1919. RIC policemen had resigned or been killed because of the campaigns against them by the Dáil and IRA. The British government brought in new groups as reinforcements. The Black and Tans were British ex-soldiers. Most were veterans of World War I. They got the name the Black and Tans from the colour of their uniforms. The Auxiliaries were former British Army officers. Both groups earned a reputation for brutality. After IRA attacks, they carried out reprisals or revenge attacks on civilians. The actions of the Black and Tans and Auxiliaries caused international criticism and encouraged more of the population to support the IRA. After the Black and Tans arrived, some of the more active IRA men had to go on the run. Groups of IRA were organised into flying columns of around 20 men. These men were better trained and armed than most IRA, 
I moved around, working with local IRA brigades to launch attacks and then slipping away. By 1920, the violence had increased in Ireland. Intelligence gathering and spy networks were important for both sides during the War of Independence. Michael Collins was in charge of intelligence at the IRA. He thought Irish rebellions had failed in the past because the British government had very good spy networks and always knew more than the rebels. He built a network of contacts around the country. Some of his contacts were double agents. They worked for the British government and secretly passed information to Collins. In Dublin Castle, there were a group of men called the G-Men. They were plainclothes police who gathered intelligence against the IRA and sometimes carried out assassinations. Collins used a group of 12 IRA men called the Squad, or the Twelve Apostles, to target and assassinate some of the G-Men. Collins destroyed a lot of the British government's spy network in Ireland. The British government brought in a new group of intelligence agents as reinforcements. They were called the Cairo Gang. 21st of November 1920 became infamously known as Bloody Sunday. Collins ordered the squad to assassinate 12 members of the Cairo gang. Two civilians were also killed. In a revenge attack, Black and Tans opened fire on a GAA match in Croke Park and killed 14 civilians. Two IRA prisoners and a civilian were killed in Dublin Castle that night. The British authorities said that they were trying to escape, but most nationalists did not believe them. 1920, the British government tried to solve the issues in Ireland by passing a new law called the Government of Ireland Act. This created two Home Rule Parliaments that would deal with Irish affairs and remain part of the UK. There would be a Parliament in Belfast that would control six of the counties in Ulster. This area had a Protestant majority and would become Northern Ireland. Around a third of the population in Northern Ireland, mostly Catholics, were not happy with partition. There would be a Parliament in Dublin that would control the rest of Ireland. Sinn Féin and the IRA ignored the Act. For them, it was too little, too late. Most Irish people now wanted more than just Home Rule. They wanted complete independence. The Act was still important for Ireland. Ireland was divided into two parts, separated by a border. This division is known as partition and is still affecting Ireland today. In 1921, the violence in Ireland had become worse and the war was making life miserable for ordinary Irish people. The British army was brought into Ireland, many members of the Dáil were in jail and there were splits between nationalist leaders. It was hard for the IRA to get weapons or stage big attacks, and they could not keep fighting. The British government also wanted an end to the war, because they faced international criticism for their actions in Ireland. In 1921, a ceasefire was declared by de Valera, the president of the Dáil, and Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister. Both sides agreed to a peace conference in London. De Valera did not attend the negotiations. He sent a delegation, or a team to represent Ireland, led by Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins. Their main aims were to get a republic for Ireland and to reject partition. The delegation was not supposed to sign the treaty without the agreement of the Dáil. The British team had far more experience with negotiations. The Irish delegation were pressured into signing a treaty that the Dáil had not agreed to. For Ireland, the treaty meant Ireland would become the Irish Free State, TDs would have to take an oath of loyalty to the King, Britain would keep some Irish ports, and a boundary commission would decide on the border with Northern Ireland. In Ireland, people could not agree on whether the treaty was good or bad. It split the Dáil, the IRA and the Irish population. When the treaty was agreed, the anti-treaty side walked out of the Dáil. Collins argued that the treaty was the best deal possible and a step towards full independence. 
he also thought that the IRA couldn't fight another war with the UK. De Valera was against the treaty. It did not give Ireland a republic and it split Ireland in two. The British government handed over control of the country to the pro-treaty side. The anti-treaty side attacked and took over the four courts in Dublin. Collins ordered his troops to attack the four courts and the Irish Civil War began. Collins's troops fired on the four courts, the National Archives and a lot of Irish history was destroyed. The Civil War split the country. Soldiers who had just fought together against Britain were now on opposite sides of a conflict. Both sides tried to take control of areas of the country. The pro-treaty side were supplied by Britain and were better armed. The Civil War was vicious with executions, attacks and reprisals. Here is an example of how the Civil War split friends. When Kevin O'Higgins was married, Rory O'Connor was his best man. Not long afterwards, they ended up on opposite sides of the Civil War, and O'Higgins signed O'Connor's death warrant. Some used the Civil War as an excuse to attack people they had a grudge against, and many of Ireland's big houses were destroyed. Many lives were lost during the fighting. Collins was killed in an ambush in Cork in 1922. By 1923, the Irish population wanted peace. Around 2,000 people had died in the Civil War, and the Catholic Church had turned against the fighting. Both sides were running out of weapons. A ceasefire was declared in April 1923. After the war, the Irish Free State was set up. The Free State Army, a new court service and an unarmed guardie were set up, and elections were held. Ireland's two largest political parties, Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael, come from the two sides of the Civil War. De Valera took apart the Free State and Anglo-Irish Treaty from within. In 1949, Ireland became a republic. This is what Collins had wanted before the Civil War. The bitterness caused by the Civil War would take generations to heal. <laughs>